Okay, great. Um, thanks everyone for being here for another uh, webinar. Um, and I'm gonna uh, go ahead and um, introduce the speakers. Um, and then I will leave the uh, floor to Andrea Wallace, who is gonna be moderating this session. Um, this activity is being organized by um, the special interest group of the Museum Computer Network, Europeana, um, the uh, Copyright Community at Europeana and Open Club. Um, and in this opportunity, we have Effie Capsalis, who is a Senior Digital Program Officer at the American Women's History Initiative at the Smithsonian Institution. Hi, Effie. Thanks for being here. Um, we also have- Great to be here. Yes, thank you. Um, we also have uh, Nicole Ferrariolo, or Nikki. Um, she is the Director of Global Strategic Initiatives at the Center for Library Information Resources. Um, hi, Nikki. Hi. And we have David uh, Tudor. Um, he's the Head of Access and Public Programs at the National Library of Wales. Um, and he's also um, an European Members Council member, and he's the co-chair of the Impact Community. Thanks for being here, David. Thanks. Hi. Um, okay, so now, Andrea, I'll leave the floor to you. Great. Thanks, Ken. Um, and thank you to the panelists uh, for being here. We've actually been really excited about this panel. Um, so I think we'll start uh, kind of playing off of some of your respective expertise. But, you know, during COVID-19 and the wider circumstances, um, I think one of the first and last things that's been on everyone's mind has been this idea of open glam and how we engage with digital audiences and you know how we do that legally accurately uh, and um, reach people in this really difficult time so we'll be focusing on some of that but at the same time i thought we'd start by asking each of you to kind of explain your relationship with open glam which obviously is pre-covid 19 and pre some of these considerations um, and some of the digital strategies and the projects that you've been working on um, with each of your respective institutions. Um, so I'll ask Effie to start. Sometimes it's a bit awkward when you just, there's a moment of silence and then everyone sits there waiting for someone else. Um, so I'll ask Effie to start. Thanks, Andrea. Um, so I uh, have been interested in, in open knowledge, open glam for over a decade, I wrote a study in 2015 before the Smithsonian um, adopted an open access policy that looked at kind of the first decade of practice in the cultural sector and the impact that the policy, open land policies have had on organizations who adopted it in that those early days. And um, it looked at a range of things from how it impacted how organizations function, staff capacity, uh, fundraising and revenue issues, um, reach and digital strategy. Um, so all different considerations there. And since uh, right before COVID, we launched the Smithsonian's own open access policy on February 25th. So um, it's been really interesting timing um, to see how that's kind of shifted, how I view this time that we're in right now. Um, but it's also been challenging, right? Because um, we're working from our different corners around the metropolitan DC area. Fundraising is stalled. Um, we're having serious uh, decline in revenue from shops and restaurants and, and all different practices that, that bring money in. So I'm excited to talk about all of these issues with everyone today. Great to all ask Nikki to respond next. Okay, great. Uh, so I work at the Council on Library and Information Resources, uh, or CLEAR, and digital strategies have been pretty central to CLEAR's work for decades, and openness has been a core component of many of our flagship programs. Um, some of you may be familiar with the Digital Library Federation, or DLF, and this is a grassroots community of practitioners focused on issues related to digital libraries. Um, one of the things, the thing that we're probably best known for with DLF is our DLF Forum, which is an annual conference. Um, it's still happening virtually, but um, like most conferences, uh, it, the dynamic changes significantly. 
Um, so one of the things that we have really been focusing on, and this has always been core to DLF, is our working groups. Um, and many of the working groups focus on issues related to open GLAM. Uh, we have a records transparency and accountability group. We have a linked open data group, a born digital access group, privacy and ethics, as well as an ethics and inclusion group and a labor group, uh, because you can't talk about openness without talking about the ethical considerations as well. Uh, another program that people know pretty well, or a couple programs, are our grant making initiatives. One of the reasons I was invited here was because CLEAR um, is a regranting organization. So we don't have our own pool of money, but we are a funder in the sense that we do distribute funds and organize review panels. So um, the two programs that we have in that area are Digitizing Hidden Special Collections and Archives and Recordings at Risk. Uh, both of them strive to make the collections that are, uh, Recordings at Risk is a uh, preservation by a digitization program and Digitizing Hidden Collections is a digitization for access program. And in both programs, we strive to make the content that's digitized through them as open as possible. Um, but we do not have like a pure like CC0 mandate or anything like that, because we recognize that it is complicated, particularly with Recordings at Risk, which deals with AV issues, or that deals with AV collections, so you're going to hit a bunch of copyright issues with that. And then also with both of them, we are paying a lot of attention to culturally sensitive materials and issues of privacy. Um, but it is, I will say that to get a project funded, if you are not showing that you can go as open as possible in an ethical fashion, um, you are really going to struggle to make it past that initial phase. Uh, another program that's worth noting is our postdoctoral fellowships in data curation. These often have a thematic focus. Uh, we've had a cohort on Latin American and Caribbean studies recently. We have a cohort on African American and African studies as well. Um, we've had ones related to uh, art history. We've had other ones related to medieval studies. Um, and these take PhDs in the humanities, usually, sometimes in the sciences, depending on the track and put them in libraries um, to learn the skills and think about different career options and also think about uh, the ways that different training can uh, enrich the field. Uh, we also have the Digital, Digital Library of the Middle East, which is a platform to federate Middle Eastern collections around the world. Uh, this is another program that strives to be as open as possible um, and is developed using open source software. And then uh, it's also worth noting some of our affiliates. CLEAR has several organizations that are connected to us um, that we serve as a fiscal host for and, our, um, and share a mission that we work closely with. Uh, so the one I'll probably be talking most about today is IIIF, the International Image Interoperability Framework, uh, which if you're familiar with IIIF, uh, it's a community of GLAM institutions that have really tried to collaborate, produce an interoperable technology and community framework for image delivery, but now we're also getting into audio and, and, other, and video as well. Uh, and if you know IIIF, you know it is like a product of the Open Glam impulse. Uh, so all of these programs were designed with a commitment to the principles of Open Glam in mind, uh, but also balanced with a commitment to equity and ethical stewardship of collections, um, and really trying to understand the intersection of these issues, which we hope will continue to evolve and mature over time. Andrea, you're muted. I totally did the, the muted thing, um, but David's ready to go. Thanks, Andrea. Yeah, my, my relationship with Open Glam began when I was a um, project officer working on a community digitization projects about 10 to 15 years ago. Um, I remember being first introduced to Creative Commons licenses and what they meant. And, um, and really, it really opened my eyes to how, how digital could, could create new opportunities for, for creativity um, and just that it was more than just seeing and not touching as it were, that people could actually create new things and we could make that happen and faci or facilitate that. Um, in 2010, I was appointed um, Rights and Information Manager at the National Library of Wales and was involved in creating our first um, IPR policy, which um, included um, the decision that we'd made not to claim copyright and digital surrogates of public domain works. Um, and that then was implemented through um, a set of, of rights statements that were applied to um, the um, Welsh newspapers website, which was which is our most popular um, resource, and it's been rolled out over the years. Um, but I don't think our hopes for um, for open access and what it would mean for the library were realised until we really began to collaborate with Wikimedia projects. Uh, we appointed a Wikimedian in residence at the National Library of Wales in 2015 
and um, Jason Evans, who's been in that role since since then, um, has um, really shown us the, um, the, the the potential the potential that open access offers for not only in terms of of um, the exposure or, or taking our collections um, much beyond far beyond our own platforms, but in terms of engagement and participation and just um, reuse generally. Um, and the, the scope of that activity has just extended and um, and, and deepened, I'd say, um, over the past five years. Um, we went from a joint funded post Wikimedia in Residence with Wikimedia UK to a post that was funded by Welsh Government projects, which saw the uh, potential impact of the partic of, of participation in Wikimedia projects. And now it's um, the role is um, fully funded by the National Library of Wales um, as um, a national Wikimedian. Um, so I think that that summarizes. I mean, um, our we have our open access policy, which is which is um, standard, I guess, for giving access to our collections. Um, perhaps we'll have an opportunity at some point to discuss more of the, the complexities of of that journey over the past um, eight years. Um, but it's it's through the Wikimedia work that we've really seen um, the potential of, of of open access for our collections. So I, I think each of you actually brought something out that was really important, which is the time and resource intensiveness of open access, and especially um, learning from uh, the you know, the lessons that other people have done from the important work in this area, because even Effie's paper, um, when it was published in 2016, was just gobbled up by the sector because it had some really important data in there and some uh, reflective practices about how different institutions were approaching this in different ways, um, which is very clear from the, the different conversations, but also there's some really interesting overlap. Um, so I think one thing that we should also probably talk about from the very beginning and address that elephant in the room um, is thinking about how those priorities, given you know the past eight or 10 years um, of experience in moving our institutions through open access, um, are now shifting pretty dramatically with the COVID-19 situation, especially thinking about budgets and how we're trying to fulfill even a larger digital remit at this point in time um, with, uh, with less resources. Um, but maybe I'll start with Nikki and ask Nikki to specifically speak to some of the challenges, especially around grantees and institutions that might be facing, um, because I think you'll have some insight here that will be really important for people who are thinking about applying for funding during this time to, to help move that needle forward. Yeah, um, it's been an interesting perspective to be a re-grantor because we don't have a big endowment ourselves. So we ourselves are a grantee that is applying for funds um, while also kind of working with a large pool of grantees between these two programs that we have. And one thing that I will tell you is, and that it's no surprise to anyone here, is institutions are hurting. Um, our programs focus on institutions in the US and Canada. So we do not have, um, very many like you know, large national libraries or institutions that have this funding, um, there's not a ton of government support. And so when you see those revenue streams start to dry up, people, the first place they look is for grants. Um, if you think about the timeline for our various programs, um, so we, for our Recordings at Risk program, um, our review panel was like the week after the it, COVID-19 was declared a global pandemic, so there, we didn't, there wasn't time to kind of see adjustments. But the next round of applications that we've received, um, the next application deadline for our program was Digitizing Hidden Collections, which was in April. And we saw, so not too shortly after um, lockdown started in the US, and we saw a 50% increase in applications for that program. And, um, and you know, it was because of a regranting program, we have to like announce when new funding cycles are happening. And we're still like in the process of the renewal for that program. So we don't know necessarily that there's going to be funding. So it could have been that that bump was because it was like the last year of guaranteed funding. But um, I do think that COVID was a big impact on that. Um, and yeah, I and mean, what we're seeing with our grantees, we with recordings at risk, we um, which is kind of on a similar cycle in terms of uh, when people would be wrapping up their projects. With the cycle that was about to wrap up, we had no cost extension requests from every single project except for two. 
uh, because it, this, the shifts were so dramatic, uh, we're seeing massive scale backs in uh, what the planned deliverables were, um, which, is a, which is actually totally okay with us because we recognize the situation and our priority is making sure that grantees are safe um, and we want to try to promote employment and nobody losing their job to the extent possible uh, through these programs. It's a tricky position to be in trying to do, as a funder, you're supposed to do as much good as you can given your resources. Um, and what does that mean in a COVID era? And what does it mean when you talk about openness, which has been traditionally a huge priority for these programs? Um, where does that fall vis-a-vis -vis, um, you know, people keeping the lights on and people maintaining their health care? And I don't think that the two are mutually exclusive at all. And I think that you can design programs in a way um, that accomplish both. But I think that these are, you know, there's like suddenly we're dealing with the Maslow hierarchy of needs, uh, which is not something that we are used to thinking about in the sector. Um, and the other thing that I think we are noticing is that sometimes like, so, you know, in addition to the mass layoffs, um, we're seeing kind of funding get cut around, like people don't necessarily want to divert funds to supporting their digital asset management systems. We are seeing um, projects getting stalled because vendors are suffering. Um, some of the vendors can't get into their buildings because of lockdown. Some of them um, can do it safe, like feel like they can do work safely, but they have changed their workflow. And so they're working at like half the speed that they normally would be working. We have institutions that had already received digitization grants that can't access their collections because their buildings are shut down. Um, the ones that seem to be doing best are the ones that kind of on their way out the door just threw a scanner and a couple boxes of materials in their car. But it's pretty rare that institutions actually let, um, I mean, it depends on the size of the institution, but not all institutions will let staff take their collections home with them. So how are you going to do a digitization project um, if you can't actually access the collections? Uh, yeah, we, and. Um, we're seeing a lot of creativity and we are seeing a lot of institutions where there isn't necessarily that room to be creative because of um, the policies that were put into place. Um, we are seeing more transcription and metadata work that's happening, um, which has been kind of an upside. One of the things that um, we have this blog series called COVID Recollections, uh, which, and if anybody here would like to contribute, um, we're accepting proposals still but um, where people can kind of process um, what this means for the profession and what they are going through and how they are adapting. And uh, we recently had an interview with um, Lydia Tang, who started the um, Archivist at Home document from the Society of American Archivists, if you're familiar with that. And this is based on the notion that uh, many, like when COVID hit, and archivists were separated from their collections. Uh, many in institutional leadership didn't actually understand what they were doing when they were at home. So it's a document that's put to get, pulled together resources for how to talk to your administration and advocate for the ability for archivists to work at home and work in a safe, socially distanced manner. Um, and one of the things that you're seeing is like the, a lot of the digital work can happen at home. Um, the actual scanning of documents can't happen if you're separated from the material, but there's so much metadata work and there's so much programming work and curatorial work and education work that goes into that. Um, and so it's been interesting to watch those shifts as well. Effie, I saw you nodding pretty vigorously to some of that. So I'll ask you to jump in next. Yeah, I, so just to explain a little bit my context, um, Smithsonian is a quasi-federal agency, so we are partially funded by the federal government, and we're free in the sense that we don't charge entry to our museums, um, and we also now don't charge um, for access to our digital collections. Um, I, I lead the digital strategy for the American Women's History Initiative, um, as well and we're thinking about representation in our collections which is a huge challenge and we also just got funding to develop a, a, a project on race and the impact that's uh, going on right now in the US and both of those present challenges inherent in collections and, and metadata and I'd say even some of our large museums don't have kind of the basics in terms of staff to um, add metadata to digital collections. To enhance metadata, that's a pretty tall order, especially when there are tons of um, ethical considerations around how you um, describe 
diverse populations in the US. Um, so um, I would say for me, what's really hit home is that, you know, we are traditional organizations. We come out of the history of exhibits and collections. We are still not funding the basics for digital. Um, we have uh, ne'er <laughs> any UX staff across our large organization of over 6,000 employees. We don't have people who can analyze data about audiences across all the different functions that we do as an organization. So um, I would just caution us to um, really think about that foundation. This is a really great time to reassess, right? It's a time to step back and assess, you know, where we fund uh, staff in our organizations and what we're actually ready to do. It would be great to provide like the most awesome virtual experiences with our museums, but I just really don't think that we're quite there as a sector. We really need to think about how we can do some of the basics better before we run to doing the amazing. Thanks, Effie. That's a very realistic perspective as well, um, because I think some of the expectations have been so high uh, that you know you you want to meet those, but you still have to, I guess, you know, have that that perspective uh, in order to give it context. Um, so, do you, do you want to respond to some of that? Yeah, um, the situation. I think it really has put a focus on digital. Um, and not only from a user standpoint, but in terms of how we're delivering it. And what struck us at um, NLW is really um, how, how much uh, that aspect of the library's work is delivered by a certain, I, I mean, there's a question of how, how that is resourced. Um, so that, so while our digitization has come to a stop, the, um, we've been, <laughs> our digital strategy has to be delivered now um, well, we weren't in a position um, at the beginning of this to be able to deliver our digital strategy f through digital um, methods or by digital means. So we've been um, adjusting um, to, um, to that. But, but yes, I think um, it, it does highlight uh, and the urgency, the urgency that this situation gave um, to um, ensuring that our digital services were um, not only maintained, but we're meeting the expectations of our users more than ever um, has really put that um, pressure on and put a focus on it, which I think will influence, um, will influence our, our strategy going forward as well. So related to that and thinking about staffing issues and where there's demand, um, I wonder if, and I know, Nikki, I'm not sure if you've had experience working with Wikimedia, um, but I know especially that David and Effie have, and so, uh, feel free to offer some sort of, you know, anecdote um, or jump in with that. But how have you, have, has working with Wikimedia's partners and volunteers and even employing a Wikimedian in residence kind of shifted how you start to think about the contributions that are made um, by wider audiences versus um, part of the staff or how you're able to actually engage and fulfill some of um, those demands a bit differently? Uh, I think there's probably a lot of people turning to Wikimedia at the point at this moment to think about Wikimedia Commons as even a platform and starting to think around what some of those initial thoughts were. I'll go first. Um, yeah, I think, I think when we first appointed a Wikimedia in residence, um, the, the, we were really being driven by the idea of, of, of access and, and more people seeing content and one of the revelations for us quite early on was, was the opportunity it was creating for participation and engagement and creating spaces for that participation, whether it was through um, a, an edit-a-thon on, on library premises or, um, or just that someone somewhere could, could create an activity or an activity around our content. Um, so, so I think, um, and, and I think that's, that's a really important shift um, generally in how um, cultural heritage institutions are working with users um, rather than being seen as the, the authority 
um, that we are that, that it's we are creating collaborative spaces um, and and Wikimedia projects have just been a, a great um, platform for, for doing that um, and we're seeing that kind of activity extending to other um, areas now as well through um, crowdsourcing projects that aren't necessarily using um, Wikimedia projects and platforms. Great. Effie, do you want to follow on that? Sure. Yeah. So I came into uh, Wikipedia work um, a while ago because we had several, it was when I was working for the archives of the Smithsonian and we had um, a lot of mysteries. We had the history of science in our collection and we had a lot of mysteries in our collection about women who were labeled on the back of pictures by their married name or were um, uh, just not even, you know, missing as a credit in a photo among a sea of men. So we quickly realized that the crowd could help us there. And um, pretty soon, you know, we were writing blog posts about this work and asking for help or reporting on the results of these things. This is in the day of Flickr Commons. So the, I'm going, I'm going way back here. But um, so that like to me, highlighted exactly what Daph, Daph had just talked about, about um, inviting people in because they can really help us fill in some information. So fast forward to now, we have a major initiative about uh, American women in history. Um, we are uh, looking at how a combination of digital curators and crowdsourcing and machine learning um, can help us surface more women's stories across our 19 museums, um, archives, and libraries. So that's one side. The goal for me with the digital strategy for the Women's Initiative is to increase representation of women online, period. So it makes sense to go in Wikipedia, right? That's the entryway to, to any kid's search online today. Um, and I'm about to bring on, uh, luckily I had some leftover funding from phase one of open access, but we're gonna also bring on a Wikimedian at large. Um, we already have a Wikipedian for the women's initiative, but now a Wikimedian at large, who's gonna think about at scale contributions of structured data. And um, so the curators are developing spreadsheets of uh, notable women in our collections. And that is like a really simple tool, right? For someone who may not totally be um, fully digital, but they can put in birth dates, death dates, a notability statement, other like dates related to their um, work life. Uh, so, and then, you know, the, the Wikipedian, uh, Wikimedian in Residence is going to develop the tool set for us to, to ongoing contribute large sets of data. And then the third step of that, which is going to be further down the road, is how we can maybe bring some of that back as the crowd contributes. But that's a major, you know, it takes the humans on the other side to receive the enhanced data and to, to integrate that back into collections management systems. And that's, again, more resources, more staff effort. So we have to be cautious. Yeah, can I just add as well that, um, that, that, that what's striking in, in this participation is, is we're seeing the difference that a cultural heritage or, or institution can make through the process of participation as well as the actual output at the end. Yes, data sets are being enriched and, and that will enhance discovery in the future, but, but it's great to see how engaged the, 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 the users, the public, the groups we are working with become in that activity of, um, of, of contributing to the, to the various projects, whether they're um, Wikimedia projects or crowdsourcing generally. You get lifelong fans, I think. Yeah. Like people really appreciate your resources. They, they have like a firsthand experience with it. So it's a really rich, just for that alone. Do you want to add anything to that, Nicole? We have not had the privilege of working with a Wikimedian in residence, um, but I am a big fan of the program myself. So it's been interesting. It's been great to hear from the other speakers about their experiences. I have a follow-up question to that actually, and this may be because of my own. I haven't. I've not yet uh, participated in a, an edit-a-thon, um, but I was wondering if just 
you know, with everything shifting to having to work remotely, if you've seen either an uptick or growth with people engaging with some other resources that are available on Wikipedia or even, um, you know, reaching out to you to ask how, how they can, you know, work on this during this time. Um, so if you could reflect on that. I can, we, we just piloted a virtual edit-a-thon for um, the women's initiative. It was interesting. We, we didn't publicize it a ton because we weren't sure how things were going to go. And it was on Zoom. We did the kind of typical lecture at the beginning, you know, little not behind the scenes peek because no one's on site yet in the U.S. Um, and, and then it was just 45 minutes of very targeted editing and we asked people to add information to the info boxes, which are the, um, the structured data piece that shows up on major search engines if you search for someone's name. And we had in 45 minutes, over 4,000 words added, twice the amount of volunteers. So we usually have around 30-ish volunteers. This had 68 volunteers and um, and it was easier to spin up like in the virtual environment, right? We didn't have to get special security to let people in and, and pay those extra costs and, and catering. Unfortunately, we couldn't provide snacks for people. <laughs> but um, to me, like, it's just great to know that we can do this a little more frequently, smaller asks and, and tailor it to the online environment. Yeah, we, we've shared um, around um, 17,000 images on um, Wiki Commons and in April, and about half of those feature in Wikimedia, in Wikipedia articles. And this April, this last April, is the, we had the highest number of page views that we've seen um, since the beginning of, since we started sharing images on, on Commons. And that was 23 million page views. Um, it's gone down a little bit in May and June. Um, to just over 20 million for both months, but in terms of in terms of um, use of Wikipedia, that suggests that it's it's gone up, and we're seeing that in the number of page views for for images. And yeah, um, as as a Wiki, Wikipedian myself, um, writing Wikipedia articles can be quite a lonely experience from time to time. Um, so editathons are a good opportunity to bring people together so that they can so that they can work on certain themes um, together. And I see. Um, Zoom is a great platform or similar platform, online platforms as, as just um, hopefully they'll be used more um, from now on to, to bring people together to work on these kinds of projects. And um, I can't speak specifically to Wikimedia. Um, I know that many of our grantees have um, tried to do some work related to Wikipedia and Wikimedia as well as some of our, the fellows in our postdoctoral fellowship program. Um, but I do not have those examples top of mind, but I just wanted to emphasize um, how important it is to build that community and those connections um, via engaging your community in kind of the actual knowledge production work. Um, I mean, obviously it's not for everybody, but for the people who want that, it can be so meaningful. And we've really seen that with transcription actually. Um, particularly for some of the smaller institutions that used to host events and have people that came in regularly and were just like a, a cultural touchstone for them or a community pillar um, in their lives and suddenly they're, they've been cut off from access to that um, and having the ability to have a community of transcribers that can be in conversation with each other um, has been really meaningful. Yeah, that's a great point. It's um, all of those networks are moving to digital spaces. So when the digital space is there and the infrastructure is there, it just it can support it, yeah. Um, so there's a question actually from uh, from the chat that overlaps with what I was going to ask Ness next. So I'm going to jump to that. Um, and uh, the panelists are asked to speak to a bit more about the challenges and hurdles in developing open access programs. So not only with funding for team members to digitize, but also expertise needed, especially maybe legal, um, around making determinations about access and risk and thinking about the legal and ethical considerations around going open. Um, and I know, it's, you know, there's been, a, there's a lot of expertise here to tap into. So um, maybe Effie, I'll ask you to begin. Sure, I think I'm still coming down from it because I was supposed to go on vacation after the launch in April. <laughs> so um, I'm still tired. Uh, I, I, I think, um, 
you know, luckily there are lots of examples out there that you can ask people how they did it now and lots of papers and things like that. And SCAN is amazing that hosting that conversation on the Open Glam account um, and they have a blog too that points to a lot of this information. Um, for us, the challenge was, uh, was a few things. One is just the simple definition of what open access is and what does it apply to. So we're a research organization as well as public museums, libraries, and archives. So we had to be very careful that we were really just talking about digital collections um, uh, for this beginning phase, right? It could expand into other areas. Um, the other tension for us was we do have, uh, we rely heavily on revenue from our restaurants and shops and, and other um, brand partnerships and things like that. So we had to have really detailed conversations about what was gonna be free and what was gonna be paid. We don't charge entry to our museum. So we have to carve out some space for, um, a lot of space for revenue generating activities. Um, the third thing was uh, really um, thinking about the different legal issues across our diversity of collections. We have museum art history. <laughs> I mean, so not, we do have museum history actually, but art science and uh, uh, humanities and history. So we had a lot of different issues at play and being a quasi federal institution and we released 3D, which brought a whole new set of questions to our, our legal team um, that were a little bit unfamiliar for them, like 3D technology and, uh, is a complicated medium to understand. So, you know, we had to bring in some some folks to really talk through those issues. So I think the challenge is um, probably going to be culture also for organizations because it is a certain amount of letting go. What what David was, uh, Daffod, I'm not sure how to say Daffod or David, but anyway, um, Culture is, is, you know, people are to different degrees more or less comfortable with this and what it's going to mean for their job specifically. So it, it's a lot of conversations. It's a lot of kind of hand-holding, talking through these issues. And at a large organization, that was a lot of time. It took us a year to get there after the decision was made. So um, it's, it's a lot of staff effort. David, do you want to jump in next? Yeah. <laughs> um, thanks. Yes, it's David. David. Um, yeah. Um, the yeah, I think the challenge. The challenge is there. There are the. Um, I, I suppose that it's it's um, yes, it's it's a legal question, but it's also um, a strategic a strategic one. Um, I think of it in three three aspects. I suppose there's the policy decision, which was one that we made quite early on. And as Effie says, there's, there are now lots of examples, lots of resources to help um, put, put forward the the argument that open is is makes good business sense. Um, in in a, in a way, making that policy policy decision um, can be the the first and the easiest step in some sense it's it's just making that decision the second element i see is is building the infrastructure around open practice um and i'm thinking now um, on an organizational scale not just on a on kind of project level um and that's right from how files are made accessible how data is made accessible so that that openness can really be used in the way that it's intended to through the open access policy, through to the messaging about reuse and how we would like to encourage our users to, to share with us the way that they're using collections because part of, of that um, reluctance that Effie was referring to about letting go is about that sense, the need to control. And one argument that, that, um, that I've heard is, is in a way that we need to maintain control so that we know what reuse is being made of the collection so that we can demonstrate the impact. Um, but if, if we can really 
rather than having a bolt-on approach to open access, if it's embedded throughout the organization uh, and that there's an infrastructure and there's a culture around that that's all about um, working with users, encouraging users to let us know how they are using, because that helps us then to make even more um, collections, even more content and data available for reuse. Um, then, and, and that is a that is a challenge. Um, change on that scale is, is a big challenge. And then the third one really stems from what we've learned from our collaboration with Wikimedia is um, how to be, that it's not just a question of just putting content there and saying that it's open. We need to identify stakeholders, potential users who would be interested in this content and take it to them um, so that we can drive and ma or maximize that potential impact that we see in the collections and demonstrate how open access really does um, does bring change, does make an impact. Um, and that's around communication, engagement um, and participation. And then that comes all the way back to, to the infrastructure that we have to support that as well. And I'll add to what the other two speakers said. It seems like the um, we've talked a lot about kind of the legal considerations, the strategic considerations. And so I'll just kind of fill in the last thing that I see is really important is the ethical considerations. Um, I think that it's important before going open to make sure that we every time we like re ask ourselves why we're doing this. Um, and I think in most cases there's a very compelling answer for why to make why to put your materials open. But I do think that especially like as you assess collections to just ask like what is the priority for this collection for instance was this collection obtained in a spurious colonial fashion should we actually be focusing on repatriation instead of openness um, is there culturally sensitive material should we have tk labels and have a sort of tiered access to this um, because really the priority is um, protecting identities or protecting cultures um, uh, and thinking about who has control over these collections and the power dynamics there. Um, I think that, especially when you look about look at things like archiving protests, um, if you're looking at some of the Black Lives Matter protests, there's like very sensitive data about identities. And so these are the sorts of things that have to be handled carefully. Um, so I think that it's great to have an institutional um, openness, open access mandate, um, but just kind of think about the nuances for what this means for different types of material. And when you put that policy into place, um, leave room for sensitivity and to um, put that care in for the materials that warrant it. Um, and then the other thing that I think we should think about, which also has an ethics component, is um, who are the communities that we are serving with openness um, and who are the people that are affected by this the people behind it and so this includes um, the users obviously the users of materials um, this includes the laborers and the workers um, who are making it open access what does it mean for them and Effie got into this and also um, what does it mean for the people who are invested in the collections maybe if it's their aunt, like photos of their ancestors um, uh, the community that is uh, most invested and yeah these are things that we really need to think about i mean one of the examples that comes to mind is a couple years ago um neh had to deal with this issue where um you remember the book the immortal life of henry Lax? you had like the hela cells um some recent like extremely zealous researchers uh decided to sequence the genome of the hela cell um which then kind of exposed that data because like nih has this like openness uh, mission um, with their with dbgap and uh, collecting all of this data uh, for scientific use it potentially had the risk of putting the genome of the lax family um, available to wide swaths of researchers which is extremely problematic and there was all sorts of work that needed to be done to uh, retroactively um, protect the lax family um, and bring people together to work at those difficult issues so these are the sorts of things that are really best um, arrived at up front um, I love the idea of um, committing to openness and really building that in from the get-go, but I also think that this needs to be handled with care because there is so much potential for sensitivity. I'm so glad you brought that up, Nicole. Um, I, anyway, I wish I had brought that up, but we spent a lot of time thinking about collections. We have a, a large African-American history collection. We have um, really, disturbing images of slaves. We have um, American Indian collections that um, some of which should only be viewed by the communities themselves. 
So we, we carved out, and I'll just pop the value statement in the chat, we carved out uh, our ability to not open access any collections we didn't think were um, appropriate for doing that exactly for the reasons that Nicole says so well. And plus, it's additional work to think through what is the best practice in presenting these collections. Um, you know, we uh, have a lot of work to do in terms of ADA accessibility, which was mentioned earlier on in the chat of our digital collections, just given the size, we're, we're really behind on that. So it was important for us to commit to doing better there. Um, we thought that being open access with some of our collections could help attract some partners to help us do that. And, um, but it's, it's important to be transparent too, uh, as an organization that we're not, not there yet. Yeah, I think, um, I, th I mean, that's such a crucial area right now that a lot of people are thinking about, not just with respect to the collections, but even like our individual, how we engage and interact and what we find out is happening because of networked data and the potential um, for all of these things. But then especially with collections, you know, they're, you know, you were talking about um, living people who could potentially be identified, but even when the person in, in the image is no longer living, we can still start to think about their family members um, and the networks of, of privacy that we need to protect, which is uh, ever increasingly more important. Um, and I, I, I actually, I want to go back to something that David said, um, which I love, I picked up on, um, is that open makes good business sense which this also plays into because it's bad for business to do things that aren't well thought out and, you know, um, that can backfire on you. But I, I was wondering if each of you could maybe speak to the ways that like your understandings of what business is, you know, it's not just the financial direct revenue that we start to think about when we're thinking about intellectual property and how sexy that is and what we can do to support the institution, but how your understanding of impact, how your understanding of, um, of you know return on investment and business and all of these words that have very strong connotations associated to them have shifted through open access you know how has that then become embedded into some of the ways that you've approached digital projects going forward and i might ask uh, david to start with this one because of his work with the impact playbook um, if that's okay sure um thanks yeah on, on you know, on the financial, just looking at the financial aspect of it, it's interesting that we're talking about the cost of open access um, when it's not often asked what the cost of commercializing collect or monetizing collections is. Um, and I think there's that that's a, that's there needs to be that balance in that discussion. Um, so, so when I think of big, good business sense, even in that very narrow sense, I think that point is 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 one to be made. Um, Yes, one of the things that when when we were um, really starting to embrace open access at, at the National Library of Wales was um, that sense that um, it's also about not just the, the the cost of open access but the the value of it, um, and that that is broader than the the um, the financial um, aspects. Um, and at the time, I felt that. You know, we, we need to be able to, I mentioned control earlier in that sense that by being open, we can feel as though we are losing control of collections and that it's, they're being used in ways that we don't know of. And one of the challenges that I felt was to demonstrate um, the, the, um, the, the wider impact that being open has. And um, it felt in some sense, because we didn't have much evidence to support it, or at least it was, um, qualitative rather than quantitative evidence. So we had certain examples of, of, of collections being used creatively, for example. Um, it, it didn't feel as though we had a robust methodology for that. And so when I heard that Europeana were developing an impact playbook, I thought, well, this, that was exactly what I felt was, was needed and I could see the value of, of that resource. Um, and so when, when it was launched, I think back in 2017, um, we were keen to, to, to start using it as soon as possible. Um, and it's, um, it's, it's, I could talk, talk um, all afternoon about um, the impact playbook, um, 
but it, it's what, what it's what it, I feel is great about it is that it does put the focus on on stakeholders, both internal and external. Um, it, it, it involves empathy mapping, so looking at a situation for, through the eyes of or looking at opportunities um, from your activity that arise from your activity through the eyes of, of users and stakeholders um, and, and thinking more broadly about value, about the strategic perspectives um, and how and, and, it, and, it's, and it's a question of how you design your activities to deliver the the desired impact for both for your stakeholders um, as well as as the strategic perspectives but there's very often um, an alignment between both so um, I strongly encourage everyone to to, um, to have a, a look at the impact playbook and there are case studies both in the impact playbook and in the Europeana impact community um, web page on Europeana pro that gives it shows how it has been how it's been used um, and you mentioned right at the beginning I'm, I'm co-chair of the impact european impact community steering group and um what we hope we what we want to do is 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 really promote impact assessment um and to nurture practitioners um we as practitioners are, are still learning um from that and um and we're keen to to share that with with others who see the importance of being able to discuss the impact of cultural heritage beyond um, the beyond beyond the economics um, or the financial aspects of it. Um, and and we have a webinar coming up quite soon um, on that. So I'll toss it out to Nicole and uh, Effie. Either of y'all can. Sure. Um, I think in terms of business sense, that is going to vary by institution. Um, I think that depending on your business model, whether um, you kind of err towards a quid pro quo business model, or if you err towards a we are like a public good institution, and um, you should support us because like and many nonprofits will have this model. Um, I think that that will change. Um, how financially um, effective it is to make an emphasis towards openness. There are some institutions that like, I, like I, it's not my favorite, but there are some institutions that do a really good business by selling access to their collections. Um, and there are other ones that hold on to that, in, that income, but it's really just like pennies. It's like the tiniest fraction of their total budget. Um, and most of their funds come from donors or from grant funds. Um, and so I think that if you are an institution where the majority, like the bulk of your business model is based on that argument that your institution serves the public good, um, going open, if you do it in a responsible, ethical manner, is a way to really double down on that and make a strong argument for why your institution is serving the public good and who you're serving and democratizing that access. I think that's oh, also great. Funder, funders really like it when you commit to openness, just so if you're thinking about grants, FYI. Yeah, I was, I mean, that was one of the, the, the question I, I looked into was how much money we get from funding uh, due to, um, and, and the increasing policies in the U.S. for these organizations to fund more open programs. So that was, that was a stark reality for us as an organization. Um, it's a little different context in, in other countries. So, um, but I think the other thing I'm really realizing, and I'm going to say something not very um, popular probably, <laughs> is that we aren't very good at strategy as a sector. Um, I think, you know, we do invest a lot in digitization, in description, in metadata, but why would we do all that investment if we weren't going to have an impact and and it is tied to our mission you know my mission at the smithsonian is increase in diffusion of knowledge and my founder back in the 1700s believed in sharing knowledge so i it was so core to who we are as an organization um and his firm belief that uh the sum of all knowledge could only be accumulated in conversation with people around the world why would we lock that down? We're in different times with different tools for communication and sharing. So it was really for me just bringing our mission into the 21st century. Um, 
But then, you know, like it does bring benefit to your awareness as an organization and you can turn that into better fundraising. You can turn that into partnerships um, that could help your bottom line. It could attract Wikipedians to help further your mission. So there's so many like intangible, tangible benefits to an open access program. And I really do, it was really a hard question to answer for many of our museums, how much money they were actually making from doing traditional rights and reproduction business. They didn't quantify the costs of doing that business, which is not a small thing. Answering hundreds of emails and form pushing and things like that. And Te Papa did a great mini analysis after they did, I'll, I'll go find the link, but it was like, this is the amount of work that we save from going open in terms of form pushing and emails. And it was great. Like I, I batted that around in the lead up to us doing our policy of like, hey, collections managers, you're gonna save a lot of time. <laughs> so you could do more mission critical work in description and photography and things like that. I liked um, I liked the intangible, tangible thing because I think so many of kind of the measurement values of measurement and systems of measurement that you know we're used to to kind of living by and defining by don't adapt to open access and this kind of like fluid exchange um, of expertise uh, that you know you can engage in when you when you open your collection. So um, it's really interesting to think about how we capture that, which is why the impact playbook is such a wonderful um, kind of in, in intervention there. Um, so there's another question kind of related to that, actually, when we're thinking about um, how we do kind of engage with the exchange of expertise. And um, uh, one of the question here is, you know, considering all of us panelists are kind of UK, US, um, Global North based, um, how do these experiences and insights, how can we bring them into conversations with smaller organizations um, and li uh, archives and libraries within the UK and US, or even think about those partnerships and the exchange of expertise um, that could be happening with the Global South. Um, so thinking about, you know, mentorship, but also um, as a, a fluid back and forth. Um, so have, have any of you had experience with that? Effie, you're muted. I'm no? sorry, I was oh, dealing go. with a, an eight-year-old. Oh. Please, someone go ahead. <laughs> no worries. I, can I, um, can I, oh, sorry, go ahead. Oh, no, no, please, uh, Evelyn, actually, I imagine you have a lot to say about this. <laughs> oh, I mean, like, I think that you, you clearly have all the expertise necessary on this because you have been working on digitization in the Global South so much, right? But I think that this sort of speaks to like some of the different challenges, right, that are there because like in some, like, especially in the global north is more about like business models, about ethical and legal considerations. While I guess that in the global south, and like, please Nikki, go ahead and intervene after my um, intervention is that like, we are still sort of stuck in the technical challenge, right, in like actually getting <laughs> those uh, materials from the analog format into the digital one. So you, you can definitely speak about that challenge. Um, in terms of the question about how to share and bring these insights, one of the clear initiatives um, or clear adjacent initiatives that comes to mind that just happened recently was this symposium that was put on by some of the clear postdocs that were in our Latin American and Caribbean cohort. Um, and they put together, so that each of, there are these four, uh, postdocs that were all working at institutions in the U.S. that had partner institutions in other countries. Uh, so there was one that was a partner institution in Mexico, there's another one in Haiti, uh, there's, uh, I have to pull up the list of all the countries, but um, CLEAR offered these micro-grants where fellows could kind of collaborate on a smaller initiative um, and do, like, fill a gap that they saw as needed. And these four fellows, um, I'm going to throw the link in the chat to this interview that I did with them recently. Okay. Um, these four fellows, they organized a symposium to bring all of these partners together. Um, and they talked to the partners about what their interests and their needs were, and then designed the symposium around those needs, giving them a chance to 
um, highlight their work because normally it is like at these academic conference or at these library conferences, you'll see speakers from the global north kind of speaking on behalf of the global south. And um, so this is an opportunity for the partner institutions to kind of showcase their own work in the way that they wanted, and then also define what the agenda was in partnership, and then the um, the partners in the Global North participated, but um, it was really about centering um, these Latin American and Caribbean partners, and um, and then also designing the program to meet their needs. And open access was one of the big things that came up, unsurprisingly, and that was like the focus of their keynote talk because that was what really mattered. Um, but and also the goal of this was to get these institutions in the same room as funders. Um, so the fellows are really good about inviting funders from uh, wealthy organizations, largely based in the US and Canada, um, to interface with these, or, with these organizations. Um, and also it was an opportunity for the organizations in Latin America and, and the Caribbean to meet each other because many of them were dealing with similar issues, um, particularly with partnering with an R1 U.S. institution. Um, there are lots of hurdles that sometimes you need to talk to somebody outside of that partner institution about and work out strategies with. Um, so they were able to build those connections and think about how to get the most out of those partnerships. Um, so I think that that's the sort of model that I would love to see more of in terms of these exchanges of ideas, particularly because in um, the, they had to transition their symposium to be online. Initially, it was supposed to be in person in Florida. Um, but with this virtual model, I think that it's extremely feasible, and I'd love to see more of that. And I'd love to see funders funding more of these um, opportunities for people to convene, because it is really expensive um, to bridge those divides in unintuitive ways. So I just noticed it's 4 o'clock. <laughs> which means um, we are wrapping up. Uh, but at the same time, there is this really awesome question that just got posted. So <laughs> I'll pose it. And if you'd like to stick around, please do and answer it. Um, uh, obviously, back-to-back -back Zoom meetings happen. So if you need to run off, that's fine too. Um, but uh, the question is that, you know, earlier, Nikki, you mentioned that there were these complicated copyright issues around AV materials and um, thinking about the recordings at risk to applicants, that they should demonstrate they're making the collections as open as ethically and feas feasibly um, possible. So given these restrictions, you know, in, in, in order to be competitive, and you've been talking about some of the other ethical questions that we start to think about during this like push to open, um, how can we caution us to reconsider uh, privacy and traditional knowledge and harm in all cases? Are copyright restrictions a given in the digital age or perhaps even useful? Um, are they a relic of a bygone era, or era um, a relic that inhibits open access and therefore public knowledge? Um, or in other words, what obligation, if any, do scholars, librarians, and archivists have to push back or expand creatively on copyright restrictions from a legal and policy front to increase what is ethically and physically possible for open access? What are some possible first steps? So this is basically an entire Zoom call. <laughs> Hope you're free until 5 p.m. UK time, just kidding. Um, but if you, I think it, you know, maybe thinking about that in terms of first steps could be a great way for us to close off the conversation um, because it is, you know, a, a given uh, a very dense um, question. If anything popped into your head while we were discussing this and reading this that you'd like to highlight, please feel free. Uh, well, thinking about this from a grants perspective, and I'll let others um, who are more knowledgeable on this topic uh, talk about the relevancy of copyright today, but um, from like a grant proposal perspective and thinking about these issues, um, I, I don't actually work on, directly on our grants team anymore, but I used to for about five years. And um, the advice that I used to give to applicants when dealing kind of with these complicated issues is to try to, when writing your application, assemble your dream team of contributors. Um, re if you're at a large organization, just reach across to other divisions and talk to people who may have knowledge in these areas um, or like potentially bring it, like talk to others who work in the field, maybe find a collaboration. Um, because if you do not feel capable of addressing these issues for your collection, maybe you need to work with somebody um, who is more knowledgeable in this area, particularly if you're dealing with culturally sensitive material. Um, it, you should have somebody who is familiar with these sensitivities that is working with you on the proposal and hopefully getting funded through the grant as well um, and is written into the grant. So, um, so yeah, just talk to people. Um, think outside of what you already know. There are so many people who have 
been thinking about these issues in a professional capacity, but also just have the lived personal experience, um, which is so critical when thinking about um, the issues of sensitivity. David, do you want to add anything to that? Yeah, I, I, I guess my only thought um, on this is, is the need for us to, I think that there's, there's a tendency to think of, of um, engagement with users and stakeholders as something that kind of happens after digitization, that the digitization comes first and, and then we, we do stuff with it, with, uh, with those who would be interested in it. It strikes me that we need to be more transparent in our processes right from the outset and to consider, um, because there, there's a tendency to think, well, copyright lasts a very long time. So if you focus on the public domain materials, then the ethical issues aren't as relevant, but of course they do, they, they still are. And, um, and, and I think we, we need to really think about how, how we um, become more transparent in the way that we deliver digitization and how, how we approach open access um, because it's it's not it strikes me that it's just not simply a, a kind of one size fits all. It's, we have to take an, a, an approach that, that considers these like the the ethical aspects as well. And to follow on that, I think that's actually a really important and interesting area where um, cultural institutions are thinking really critically and can actually inform the law because um, you know, the law would make a binary distinction between it's in copyright or it's in the public domain. And if it's in the public domain, then it's free use for anyone. But when we start to apply those ethical limitations around it and what we decide is appropriate for, for reuse, um, that's where uh, cultural institutions are doing a lot of really interesting and a lot of um, local communities and even communities of origin, really, really important work um, to help kind of restructure and reframe how copyright might apply to some of the digital reproductions and reuse and, and make new parameters that aren't within the intellectual property frameworks. Um, so on that note, uh, I'll say thank you. Effie had to run off. Um, so thank you, Effie, but also thank you to Nikki and David. And um, this has been really excellent. We'll be making the audio transcription and or so the audio recording and the transcription available via a medium post um, in a couple of weeks. So we'll advertise that when that's available too. But thank you all for coming. Yeah, thank you. This was the first class uh, panel. Thank you all. Mm. Thanks so much for having us. Mm, thank you. Bye.